I'm Jesus Barraza. I'm, I work for Neo4j, and I'm the head of Telco Solutions. But I'm, today I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a different hat because, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of these rare creatures that has spent as much time on the property graph camp as I've you know, been spending with Neo4j the last four or five years as I have on the, well, probably a bit more on the, on the RDF side. So I, I, want, I would share my, my experience and, and, uh, and look a little bit under the hood and to show which are the difference, which are the similarities between the two, uh, the two graph paradigms. And also, Juan uh, asked me to kind of set the scene for the, for the panel. So what I'm going to do is, of course, I'm going to give you some facts, I'm going to give you some opinions, but I'm also going to leave some open questions that we'll hopefully discuss uh, afterwards. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where the title comes from. So I'm trying to, going to try to dissect this idea of the knowledge graph. Just one quick word on Neo4j, because I, I think I, I'm not going to talk about Neo4j too much today. I mean, I think my colleague Nav did a great job yesterday. But you probably have heard that some of our, our most popular uh, projects, in particular probably the, the, the Panama Papers, right, the, a few years ago here in, in the, well, actually the, the ICIJ, right, this uh, in, group of investigative journalists that use Neo4j to uncover all sorts of, you know, corruption and wrongdoing based on this leak that they got from this uh, company in, uh, in Panama, Mossack Fonseca, which actually g got them the, the, the Pulitzer Prize, right, in the building next door. So a great project. There's, there's many others. I mean, the, the, the NASA lessons learned knowledge graph and, and many more deployments uh, with uh, graphs that are, are taking hundreds of millions of, of operations per day, whether that's you know, uh, driving pricing engines for Marriott or, or uh, real-time recommendations for retailers, routing packages in, in for, for couriers, and so on and so forth. But again, that, that, that's it about Neo4j. What I would like to talk about today is the, the, the two types of graphs, right? So in an knowledge graph, uh, of course, there is a graph, right? And by now, we know that there's at least two approaches, right, two paradigms to represent data as a graph, the RDF graph and the property graph. And uh, let me give you a little bit of history on where they come from, because that explains uh, what, how, how they're different. Uh, the RDF graph comes uh, uh, late 90s, right, and it was proposed, RDF was proposed as, the, as a format for data exchange in the web, right? So the idea at the time, the web was very much, uh, you know, web pages for human consumption, so when uh, 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 Tim, uh, Tim Berners-Lee proposed the, the, this vision of the semantic web, what they were saying is, why don't we create smarter data? Why don't we get, uh, generate, rather than pages that are for human consumption, pages that pr produce well-structured data, well-defined data that can be consumed by, by robots, by agents that can do uh, clever stuff with it. And, and RDF was proposed as the, as the you know, a, a key technology for that, because that was the way in which these data had to be structured. And uh, uh, of course, naturally after that, the idea of storing persisting uh, RDF uh, became a thing and, and specialized RDF stores, or, well, triple stores at the time, uh, semantic databases. So that, that's, that's where, where, where they, they come from. And that's why um, interoperability is at the core of the model, right? It was all about distributed data ownership. So data came from all over the place. And what you want to be able to do is to express data down to the smallest fragment. That's why RDF is based on this atomic decomposition of your data in the form of logical statements. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, on the other hand, the uh, label property graph uh, that, that was created by Neo4j in the early 2000s uh, had a completely different purpose. I mean, this was a group of engineers, and that aligns with, with Brad's vision on, you know, one thing is uh, data, data architects, information architects, and these were developers, and they were dealing with this problem of working with data as, a, as an object model in the applications and having to deal with the storage that was table-based. Because at the time, of course, everything was stored in relational databases. And there was this impedance between the two models. And they thought, why, what if we came up with a way of representing data that was more aligned with the way we want to use it in our applications? What if, and, and their focus was very much about storing in an efficient way, being able to retrieve the data in a fast and efficient way. And, and considerations like data integrity were critical for them. And so very different ends on the spectrum. And while the two have the, the, this abstraction of the graph behind, they're quite different, as we're going to see. So let's look quickly at the models. We'll look a little bit under the hood. This might be a bit superfluous for some of the graph experts in the room, but I think it's, it's worth bringing it up. So um, I was saying that RDF is based on the notion of logical statement, what's called a triple, right? A triple is, a, is an assertion, subject, predicate, object. And, and if you chain assertions, if you chain triples, that forms a graph. So if I say that this is a person, is a, yeah, that's 
three or five. Uh, so that creates two nodes, I mean, two vertices and an edge. Now you say that these same uh, individual that we're describing, I have a pointer here, also has a, an ID, and that creates another edge in my graph. He has a, she has a name. There's another resource, another individual that likes her. Well, we're kind of building a graph by chaining these statements, right? But you see these underlying uh, atomic decomposition of every single statement in your data. So that's what the graph model looks like. On the, uh, on the other hand, a, a property graph, and I've tried to rephrase the same domain in kind of descriptions of objects, because that's what the property graph is. So we're going to say there is a, a person that's described by her name, her ID, and, uh, and that all forms a node. But the node has some internal structure. So you have a set of key value pairs that describe the attributes. There's another individual that has another ID, and one likes the other. So the first thing you realize is that the graph is much more compact. That's not a good or bad, it's just the way it is. Because in a property graph, the edges will only be the relationships that connect resources, as opposed to the one in RDF, where edges would be connections between resources, but also values for properties. That, as I was saying, that's not good or bad, it's just the way it is. But it's, um, as the previous speaker was mentioning, that explains why uh, when you say I have a, a, a model uh, with 100 million triples, that probably corresponds to a, a model with, uh, with 10 million nodes. Because the nodes, they keep inside them their internal structure, their attributes, right? That's, uh, um, so typically an order of magnitude is the, is, the, is the difference. But that again is just a, a, a rough estimate. Um, good. So, Obvious uh, difference is uh, that this idea that nodes in a property graph have internal structure, they can, they can have properties, and the same applies for relationships, because that, that, that's an interesting one that we're going to uh, touch on in a minute. While uh, in, the, in the RDF graph, nodes, or vertices and edges, are URIs, are strings, are unique identifiers, right? And the edges, and that's important, express the type, the type of the relationship, the type of relationship or uh, property, as it's called in, in RDF. Now, what are the consequences? Well, depending on which version of the graph you select, you will query it with different query languages, right? So if you go down the RDF route, you will query with Sparkle, which is, again, very much statement-based. As you can see, you kind of see the triples there. The thing is, your triple uh, expression, your triple pattern, includes variables, right? And that's why it's a query. It's not facts, it's a query, because you can return these variables, the question mark things, and you know, triple statement-based. Now, on the other hand, you have Cypher. I'm going to use a Cypher to, com I, I know there's Gremlin as well, but these, were, these, are, these are the two declarative languages, so and, and I thought, it, it, and, and this is the one, of course, that, that we implement in Neo4j, the one I'm more familiar with. Cypher, open Cypher, is more based on the, this kind of ASCII art description of the pattern that you're looking for. So you're kind of drawing what you're looking for. You're saying, this person likes another person, and, and you can then apply filters in a you know, very much SQL style and return having your projection where you def define what your query returns, right? So different models, different query languages. Uh, and of course, implications in the way you model your domain, right? What's the first one? I was mentioning before. Well, in, uh, in RDF, you cannot uniquely identify instances, multiple instances of relationships. By relationships, I mean the predicate of a, of a triple. What does that mean? Let me give you a simple example. So, Let's think of any kind of uh, social media or a, any, any uh, domain where you can like, uh, where you can uh, follow. I mean, you can't express that like three times in this case, like Anne or, and, sorry, Dan cannot like Anne three times because that's basically exactly the same statement. And that's just simply because, you know, you're using the type of the relationship, the type of the property, and that stated three times is exactly the same fact, right? In the property graph, you can, because instances of relationships are uniquely identified. It's not visible, but you have three arrows here, three relationships, three edges, and you can do that. A consequence of that is that you can uh, qualify them. And by qualifying them, what I mean is that you can associate properties to relationships as well, right? Things like uh, I w th there is a connection between this location, New York City and San Francisco, and the connection has a distance and a cost. Think of that, you know, any, any kind of attributes. I can do that because this is uniquely identified, right? You can't do that, at least not uh, in, in a simple way with RDF. There's, of course, alternatives, and I won't go into that details. You get the deck and you can explore them, but there's, of course, modeling workarounds. You can create intermediate nodes. You can use reification. But again, you know, 
this, to me, it feels a little bit like you know, artificial complexity that's introduced in your model because of the paradigm that you're using. It reminds me a little bit of, of what happens in, you know, in, in a relational database. If you need to model a many-to-many -many relationship, you have to create an intermediate joint table because that's the way you can do it. That's the only way. And well, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you will do it anyway because you want to reify this event, the fact, the fact that you're liking someone or the fact that you, wanna, uh, that you have a connection between two locations, but the fact is that in RDF, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a need. Good, what else? Uh, another uh, way in which the two models are different is the fact that uh, RDF can naturally have multivalued properties. I mean, it's perfectly fine to have uh, uh, a number of triples with the same subject and the same predicate, but with different uh, values for the, for the object, for the literal. In, uh, in the property graph, because we saw that the internal structure is a key value, is a map, you can have only one key. So the way to have multiple values is going to be by using arrays. Right, you have two simple expressions here, so we have, we're describing a, a, a record with a, a name, and it has two genres, so it's jazz, but it's also orchestral jazz, and that's perfectly fine, because this, I mean, it's not readable here, but you have uh, two edges, one connecting it to jazz and the other one to orchestral jazz, and that's perfectly fine. Now, in a property graph, you'll have to have one genre property and have an array of values, right? Uh, finally, uh, another difference is that um, while we've been talking about uh, RDF uh, triples, the fact is that most, I mean, probably all of the, of the RDF stores handle quads, actually, and, and that makes it possible to define uh, subgraphs, named graphs, as they're called, right? Add some kind of metadata to the triple, whether that's provenance, I mean, you can use it in many different ways. And that's something that you can't do in, in, in the property graph, at least for now. I know that there's some work going on with this, uh, um, modeling and, and, and query uh, languages working group, and maybe Juan can give us probably more of an update later in the in the um, in the panel. But that's something that's not possible at the moment with uh, with the property graph, right? So that's a very quick and very high level overview of the models and and how they're different. Now the thing is, the models will have a store behind, and that's another question that you probably ask yourself when you when you are uh, tackling a, a graph a project, and uh, the questions that you will be asking yourself. Oops. Uh, not very readable, but a little bit. But probably you will ask yourself, I mean, is integrity important to me? What level of integrity? Do I need an ACID transactional data store? What about the, the, the type of storage? Brad was mentioning before that there are stores that will have maybe a relational backend, maybe, uh, uh, it's not very readable there, but some, some kind of specialized NoSQL column-based store. Maybe it's, uh, we call it, we call it Neo4j native, but some, some kind of implementation of the idea of index-free adjacency, like, uh, a, persistence of, of the connections between, because depending on the kind of store that your engine uh, has behind, well, you will get different performance and, and, and that will be more or less adequate to the type of workloads that you're, you're, you're gonna be hand dealing with. And, and are these like deep traversals? Are gonna be algorithms? It's gonna be like heavy querying, more transactional operations? What about clustering? Well, clustering is another, cons uh, another con uh, consideration that you have to keep in mind. Do you need a, a, a multi-date center cluster? Again, this is a, uh, a data store, a, a, a sort of an engine a question and not a model. Because sometimes, you know, it's true that we find this, you know, I tend to find quite, quite confusing things like comparing uh, uh, a particular property graph store or, or, or engine with RDF. I mean, let's compare apples to apples. I mean, let's compare a model with a model and an engine with an engine. What you know, all the questions that you will ask yourself is things like what kind of licensing and support? What are your requirements in that sense? What about open source? Is that important? Right? So, yeah, I'm not going to answer this question, but that's probably some of, some of the topics that we'll be talking about later on. Right, how am I doing for time? Five minutes, brilliant. Good. So, uh, I hope that's kind of raised some, uh, some uh, you know, questions around what's uh, about the graph part. But what about the knowledge part? Because we're talking about knowledge graphs. And, uh, and the knowledge traditionally called uh, you know, semantics, maybe. So that's typically associated with, uh, with the RDF stack, right? So it's true that, that uh, the uh, RDF model accommodates models on top of it, like RDFS, like OWL, that can make it possible for you to express, according to standard vocabularies, explicit semantics, because that's the critical thing. I mean, you can have a, a, an RDF store, an RDF data set, and not have any ontology associated with it. Is that semantic? Is, that, you know, is there knowledge in that? It's just data? Well, that's you know, for you to answer. But uh, when, you're, when you're using semantics, you will do it for mainly two reasons, right? One of them 
will be, I want to share, I want to use a shared vocabulary. It's not readable here, but maybe you're using schema.org, maybe you're using Fibre ontology, maybe you're using your own enterprise ontology. So that's one of the reasons why you will want to use and create an ontology that describes your domain. Another reason might be inference, right? And that's uh, uh, well, a, a lot more complex, as you can, as you can imagine. And, and when, you, when, you, when you're thinking, do I need inference? And if so, how much? That you have to ask yourself the question of what's the, the cost of, of creating this explicit knowledge. Because in the end, I mean, we've been talking about uh, uh, creating ontologies. That, especially uh, those of you who are in the art space, you know that that's not an easy task. I mean, it, it, it's, it, there's some effort to be put in there. And, and then you have to take in, into account as well, how do you use these ontologies for inferencing? And you know that as your data size grows, probably there's levels of, of, of expressivity in your ontology or in your semantics that will not be able to work with that. So it's going to be a balance. So these are elements that you have to keep in mind as well. What about algorithms? What kind of algorithms will you get with one or other platform, right? That's uh, another, another interesting uh, point, another question to keep in mind. Finally, uh, I was uh, a bit ambitious before I knew that it was going to be a 20 minute talk and I was thinking maybe I can run a demo because uh, I wanted to show that there's some of these traditionally associated semantic capabilities associated with the RDF stack that can be run on the property graph. Thank you. Uh, and well, th I'm probably not going to have time, I'm certainly not going to have time to do that now, but just uh, uh, I mentioned them and of course I can run that offline if for those of you who are interested. But things like I was mentioning before, RDF is a model for data exchange, so uh, RDF compliance does not impose necessarily having to store your data in a triple store. That's probably the most natural way to do it, but it's not unusual to, to have your data coming out of any kind of store, in particular with Neo4j or with a property graph. You know, the, 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 the friction is going to be a lot, a lot smaller than with relational databases, but you can also expose it as, as, as RDF because both are graphs, and that's kind of a natural way to, a natural thing to do. You can align with, uh, with standard vocabularies. You can, you can expose your property graph, your Neo4j graph, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, according to the FIBO ontology, to the schema.org ontology. And, and you can do inferencing. Of course, controlled inferencing, and we, by no means, we claim that we can do, uh, or the, I mean, there's, there's companies, if there's partner companies that have developed general purpose reasoning engine that, that, do, that, that, that run partially uh, uh, OWL, on top of Neo4j and all the types of stores, but we're not in that space. But you can certainly, because in some cases, maybe all you need, to, all you need is something like be able to define a, a, a category hierarchy and just be able to infer from that. And when, it, when it's as simple as that, there are fragments, micro-inferences that, that you can run in Neo4j. So that's what I wanted to cover today. Uh, I'll, well, I have just the, the snapshots for the demos, but since I'm not going to run them, that's probably something uh, I'll leave out of the presentation today. That's, that's me, and uh, one more minute. If there's any questions, if not, see you again in the, in the panel. Thank you very much.